السلام عليكم and welcome to part 4 about سورة الأحزاب 33 speaking about the ayah where Allah says that him and the angels pass their salat on the messenger and asking the believers to do the same thing and uh, in this part here I am going to tell you the story of the behind the ayah 56 to understand what Allah wanted from the believers in that time and for us also We need to trace back the story to the beginning, all the way to the beginning, so, you know, so that we get to know why Allah said what He said. The first thing that you need to know is this. The wives of the messenger had rooms, they lived in rooms. Back in time they didn't have two bedrooms or one bedroom, like uh, the kitchen is separate from where they, sleep, uh, they slept, no. They had one room, so each of the wives of the messenger had one room. And in that room they sleep, uh, they pray, they cook, everything, and they take showers in that room. So that's the end of it. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hujurat, that's Surah number 49, in the ayah number 4, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجُرَاتِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَيَقِلُونَ Indeed, those who call you from behind the hujurat, i.e. the rooms, most of them have no sense. The Arabs used to go, <laughs> when they needed the Prophet, what they do? They go outside, the, the, because all the wives of the Prophet used to live near each other. So would go and stand right in close to this place and they start calling, Ya Muhammad! Muhammad! That's how they call him. That's why the, the Arabs are so rude. Look at them today. With the Quran, with them 1400 years and they still the, the rude people that you can find. So what they used to do, they used to go there. So the, uh, what I, the point I'm trying to drive here is that the wives of the messenger he lived in rooms. When you look in the translations, however, they don't translate the rooms as uh, the hujurat, the rooms as rooms. They translate them in houses. A house is a house. It's an independent. And this is, oh God, the English translations are doing so much, so much evil really. It, it's, perhaps I should get one day and start writing something about this uh, translations. But it's a big responsibility really to, to translate the meanings of the Quran. But anyhow, so that's, uh, that's point number one. What used to happen back in time of the messenger? Those sexual predators, when they could not access the wives of the messenger outside, they wanted to take their hitting on the wives of the messengers inside his own home. Of course, playing the, the, on, the, on the cord of, oh my God, we are poor, we can't eat, we don't have this. When time for food would come, say it's lunch, it's 12, it's one, whatever time they used to eat back in time, they would go and straight away enter the rooms of the Prophet. So they used to spy on him to know in which room he is going to be. So, for example, today he's going to be with wife C. So they would... <laughs> They would go and find their way into the house of wife C. The lady, the poor, remember the Arabs are rude. They are not going to knock. Allah had to instruct them to knock before entering because they were animals. They would just walk like a cat, like a dog. They would just walk in. It's strange how this... And believe me, the Arabs are still like that uh, until today. Part of the Arab world is still as if it were 1,400 years ago. So they would go there and suddenly when the Prophet comes to house C for lunch, he would find a bunch of guys in his home. Oh, okay. Why they came in there, they would present the excuse like, oh, we want to eat, we don't have food. Other times, few people would go to few houses. So they, they go here and then the, the messenger would find, the Prophet would find himself, oh my God, I have like uh, three groups of men in three of my rooms. Ah, and that used to hurt the Prophet a lot. But the Prophet had a problem. He couldn't go to them. And because the Prophet knew and he could see these men were not there because of their hunger. These men were inside his home because of his wives. And the problem is his wives were not given signs or signals to these people. Don't do it. I am not interested. The wives were flirtatious. And Allah has mentioned this in Al-Quran. And I will come to it in a bit. So the Prophet had a problem. These men would walk into his home 
And the problem is he cannot chase them away. If he told them, come out of my home, and they would say, why? If he tells them, because you people are disrespectful and you are hitting on my wives, they would go out and they would spread the rumor, you know, we went to the Prophet's house to have dinner and he accused us of hitting on his wife. What kind of a man is, and you know how rumors can get out of hand and suddenly Islam in peril, is in, in danger. Because people now would pay more attention to the rumors than the message of uh, the Quran itself. And that's why Allah stepped in to resolve this huge problem. And always remember, at that time, because of the big surge of migrants from Mecca and the, and the neighboring tribes, poverty and hunger hit the believing community and, that, and the Prophet at that time hard. And uh, the, the, the idea that Khadija was extremely rich and the Prophet married, be, uh, the, that's a huge lie. Khadija was not rich at all. And the Prophet did not marry into a rich woman. But of course, to make the Prophet seem like a uh, big, huge, oh my God, what a man, they would tell you Khadija was a rich and she was extremely beautiful. So many people in Mecca so desired her. And her heart fell for Muhammad. What a lie. What a lie. Because once you believe in that, anything that the Quran will say about poverty will not sink in because you already have fed your brain something extremely wrong. And this is the problem that is faced at that moment there. Migration to Mecca, uh, to Medina, sorry, from Mecca, a lot of people come there, a lot of women, single women, widowed women, divorced women with kids, with not kids, and all these problems found themselves in Medina, problems, financial problems, economical problems, and things like that, Allah had to step in to resolve this. This is why, and I will repeat it, this is why, in Surah An-Nisa, Allah allowed the men who were rich and can take care of the orphans to marry more than a woman. The idea that the... Uh, 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 person today can marry two women is not. You don't marry for sex. You don't marry because you love another woman. You marry because you want to take care of the orphans. And that's the reason why Allah allowed it. But as usual, the man of religion stepped in, made Allah not, he doesn't know what he's talking about, and they detailed and designed a religion that is followed until today. Imagine my dear sisters and my brothers, Imagine a wife is at home going on about her business when suddenly a man or two or three or four would just push through the door and enter the house completely oblivious to the state of its occupants. They would sit down and wait to be hosted. That's it. Take care of me. This is exactly what happened to the prophet's wife. And the problem, as I said, the, the prophet faced was even though he could see these men's intentions were for the women, he can't chase them away of fear that they will build rumors and guess what? And Islam is gone bye-bye. So now maybe they need to move elsewhere because that's it. The, the, the problems will be on the rumors, not on Islam. So to put an end to this absurdity, Allah orders the believers not to enter the house of the Prophet for any reason. No matter what, no believer should enter any house or any rooms of the Prophet. The only time they could enter was when given permission by the Prophet himself. And it was not for a chit chat or having a tea or things like that. It was for a necessity of life, nourishment. Allah orders to the believers was clear. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, you who have believed. So he's not talking to the Jews. He's not talking to the Christians. He's not talking to the Arabs that didn't believe. He's addressing the Arabs. And since he used the ladina amanu, who have believed, it means a huge number of them fell in that category. He tells them, do not enter the rooms of the Prophet where he lives. Unless you are permitted for 
and that is to have a meal to eat in other words you cannot enter the house for any other reason except for food and you cannot enter without him being present and without him giving you permission you see to you and me this instruction is clear okay it's actually clearer than the sun in the middle of the sky on a hot summer day you point to it and you ask anybody what's that they will tell you it's the sun that's it but for those sickos for those psychos for those sexual perverts that they call companions that was just a setback now they have another problem to deal with before they could enter any time and whatever now they are limited they can enter just for food and they cannot enter without permission they needed to find a excuse what uh, what do you think they did they needed to up their game and find other ways to keep their harassment and sexual perversion on track they needed to keep hitting on the wives of the prophet of course Allah is watching and he knows what they were plotting so when they started plotting to find new tricks Allah reveals they certainly do devise plots and I do devise plots as well so the manifestation of Allah's plotting is very apparent in this ayah so the believers those perverted sexual predators plotted once okay we're not going to enter the home unless you give us permission but now what we're going to do so once we are inside we will not leave that's it so instead of coming like half an hour before lunch and leave half an hour after now we cannot so as soon as you authorize us to walk in we're gonna sit there for hours and that's exactly what they did all right so this new strategy shoot the prophet now they don't want to leave it falls inside the hall so Allah Ta'ala orders them something else he tells them okay now you wait permission and you walk in when you walk in the wife starts cooking then Allah tells them you cannot sit at home with the prophet awaiting the food's preparation do not wait so the message now is clear and things were getting more and more serious do not enter the houses or the rooms of the prophet unless you are permitted for a meal and do not wait for the food to be prepared to be cooked oh my god so now we just come in eat and go no he told us just don't wait for it to be prepared but once prepared we can eat and we can take our time so Allah tells them okay you wait outside the food is prepared inside and when you are given permission and invited to go inside then you go but if you are invited then go inside Allah had to tell them it's like talking to your toddler it really is like talking to a toddler to a little kid explaining to them how they should clean the room that's it so the command the instruction is clear eat and go do not linger do not hang her up so uh, Allah could have ordered the beliefs not to go to the Prophet's room seeking anything and that would have put an end to all problems but Allah is fully aware of what the hypocrites and the other people who don't like Islam because of the reasons I gave the migration economics and all that kind of stuff so Allah wanted to do things in a subtle way where it doesn't hurt Islam and that's why Allah allowed those believers with sexual agendas to keep seeking food and go to the Prophet every day so the instruction now so far is simple do not enter the house of the Prophet unless you are permitted for a meal and do not wait for the food to be prepared and if you are invited then go inside so many restrictions ay, 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 ay. so once <laughs> when they went inside okay now they just wait to go inside once they were inside and they were fed guess what they wouldn't leave actually they wouldn't leave
They would sit and chit chat while the Quran is clear. Do not enter, wait for the invitation. Once you are invited, go in and you cannot wait as the food is prepared. Okay, that's the end of it. All right, now once we are in, guess what? We're gonna stay there. And the Prophet again was hurt by this. He wants them to eat, go. Why are we here? Remember, the wife has nowhere to go. She's in the same room as a bunch of guys and this bunch of guys are sexually motivated. It does it for them. They get aroused sexually as they hit on the woman. The Prophet sees this. He cannot intervene because the rumors and Islam. The wives uh, is, uh, is not... Ah, uh, God, if the wives of the messenger had helped him, things would have been easier. But they were not. So Allah tells them, but if you are, once you eat, فَإِذَا طَعِمْتُمْ فَانْتَشِرُوا وَلَا مُسْتَأْنِسِينَ لِحَدِيثِ And once you have had your meal and you have eaten and you find, then disperse and do not linger in for a chat. <laughs> that chat was, subhanAllah, using the Prophet as a shield when in fact they were hitting on his wife. And then Allah tells them, إِنَّ ذَلِكُمْ كَانَ يُؤْذِ النَّبِي فَيَسْتَحْيِي مِنْكُمْ what you are doing, that what you are doing, really does hurt the Prophet. And he is very shy to tell you out. So when Allah said that the Prophet felt shy with them, shy as in, uh, not shy when the shy of a woman with some, uh, some foreign guy or something. No, it's not that shy. The shy is when someone does something and you feel embarrassed to tell them, don't do that. And you feel something inside you that withholds you. We call that shy. But it's not uh, shy. It's, uh, it's not uh, shy. So when Allah said that the Prophet felt shy, uh, shy with them, he meant that the Prophet had such high morals that even though their actions were hurting him and hurting his wives, he couldn't turn nasty towards them. Prophet was, after all, very aware of what was going on. He was not sleeping on his uh, two ears. Now, how these men were eyeing his wives and hitting on them and things like that, but he couldn't challenge them because it was a very difficult situation to prove. For example, yeah, for if, if he told them, you are eyeing my wives when you come here, they would tell him, who are you? What kind of wives? You just came to eat and now you're doubting us? You're throwing these rumors against us? Is this what Allah tells you? This is what Islam is all about? And that's it. Islam is dead. And you can see how things can go very wrong. This, this is why Allah Ta'ala took it upon Himself to remediate the situation and end this horrid situation where those sexual perverts put the Prophet in subhanallah and this is why allah presented himself as the sole trigger of this remedy and that the prophet had nothing to do with it so that they can't attack the prophet if they were if you want to attack attack allah but of course if they start attacking allah people won't believe them but they would believe them if they attacked a human being muhammad so allah tells them wallahu la yastahi min al -haq. while allah does not shy away from telling the truth. No one can accuse Allah. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that we do. Doesn't he know what he has created? He does know and he knows how these people think. A problem now. When these sexual perverts are inside your home, uh, the, the Prophet's home, and they are eyeing the wives and doing all these things, how the, uh, try to think, how would they s flirt with the wives of the Prophet? And the Prophet is there, remember. He is with them. How could a pervert, a psycho deranged man flirt with the wife of the Prophet? And how could she flirt back with him legally? <laughs> I mean legally because the Prophet is there. How, how, how could they do that? Well, it's easy. They are eating. For example, one of them needs uh, salt. Then he would go to the wife of the Prophet and asks her for salt. When you talk to a woman, you will look at her and she will look at you. And with the eyes you can communicate. All this was done in front of the Prophet. It's, it's incredible. It really is. And then he would ask, for example, salt or a glass of water or spoon or knife. He ask for anything that will help them eat. And the Prophet was seen there. Then Allah intervenes.
وإذا سألتموهن متاعا فاسألوهن من وراء حجاب And if you want to ask them for any item relating to the meal, spoon, salt, plate, bread, anything that helps you eat, then Allah tells them, then ask them from behind a hijab. The hijab is a screen that you put between you and uh, the other. Uh, in the United States, for example, we used to work, we have those cubicles. Cubicles is a bunch of three screens, one in front of you, one to your right, and one to your left, and you work. If you've seen the Matrix, they do uh, portray the special, at the very beginning when, uh, what's his name, Neo, uh, the, the agents go to pick up Neo from the building and Morpheus is talking to him, Neo will hide into cubicles. That That is a hijab. Those cubicles, they put an obstacle between you and the other person. So Allah tells these people, when you ask the wives of the Prophet for anything to for your food that deals with your food don't ask them directly face to face it has to be them behind an obstacle for that to take place what did the prophet do he stuck uh, some nail on the wall and, and then to the other wall he put a small string in between and they put a blanket or a piece of she or sheet or something like that and that acted as a shield that would shield them from the other one the hijab is not a, something that is a dress code it's not it's a an obstacle that you put between you and the other person so that you don't see them for that as i said to happen the prophet had to do that now it's starting getting complicated for this man imagine they are outside those predators they are outside waiting for the prophet they want to hit on his wives uh, the food is being cooked they wait outside for a couple hours whatever it is and then the prophet would invite them one after one when they walk into the room oh my god what's this <gasps> they have put a veil they have put an obstacle they have put a oh my god we can't see the woman now anymore she hides behind it Notice one thing that is extremely important, how Allah wants to resolve this problem without putting the Prophet in any kind of situation. He tells them, and when you ask them, he, Allah didn't tell them, from now on do not ask the wives directly, go to them through the messenger, as the Arabs do, as the Muslims do, as the, oh God I remember back in time, sometimes uh, when I used to work as a manager of Dawa English department in Al Muntada back in 89, uh, in those early days, 1991, 92, 93, and I used to give talks around England, sometimes in Europe and all that kind of stuff, and there were times when uh, somebody needed my help or something like that, and I tell him, okay, uh, I call you tonight or you call me. And back in time, I was good financially, so I used to call people to save the money on the landlines. Sometimes I call the, the person on the phone, his wife picks up the phone and I go, Assalamu alaikum. She wouldn't answer. Even though Allah says in the Quran, if you are greeted, respond back. She wouldn't answer. And I go, is, uh, uh, I named the man, the husband there, no answer. Uh, is he coming back later? When can he back? No answer. And then could you please give him the message like the, uh, that uh, my name is? And that's there. One day someone came and said, why did you tell your, my wife your name? I said, well, why? If I told her my name, is she going to have an orgasm? I told him literally this. I told him why is she going to have an orgasm when I tell her my name? I said, have you reached perversion to this point where... He goes, no, she's my wife. I said, heck with you. Why? you only the person on earth that have wives. I said, the prophets, why, uh, wives used to talk to people. The prophet used to invite people that were sexual predators that hit on his wives. And with that, Allah still tells them, if you ask the wives, ask them behind an obstacle. He didn't tell them, stop talking to them, talk to Muhammad, talk to their husband, and he will relay to the other people. This is the greatness of Islam. We Muslims today, we can't have family friends. If, if I used to have lots of friends, family friends, I never know their wives. I'd, if, if the wives is, is struck in the street, if she is raped, if, if in accident, I don't know her. Because to them, oh, my wife, you don't need to know my wife. But it's so incredible how much damage the Salafis have done to us. We are so, we are like men in the caves. The women, they know each other and she doesn't know who the husband is. The, the, the brothers, they know who the husband is and they don't know the wives. We are so deranged. We are so, so messed up. Oh God, please 
teach your generations, your kids, that it is okay, very okay for a man to address a woman. If those, those sexual predators would go to the Prophet, and with all their problems, Allah still allowed them to speak to the wives directly. We cannot be more pious than the Prophet, we cannot be more pious than Allah. But the Salafis, perverts, the, the, those sheikhs of the third century on judgment today, I will oppose them greatly. They have damaged our Islam, they created in us perversion. They tell you if a man is with a woman and they talk in their third shaitan, but the Quran says no, their third is Allah. But they sold us the story. And now, every time I talk to a lady, straight, I had this, my sisters and my brothers. I have women, they come because of my post as I occupied. In my last post, when I was the assistant to the director in the central mosque, Baker Street Masjid, sometimes women, Islamic Center, sometimes women come to me, Muslim women, they come for problems, for help, for things like that. Wallahi, they come and they keep looking down. And I tell my sister, I'm talking to you. They can't look me in the eyes because the moment she looks me in the eyes, I can see that spark that she's disturbed, that she is thinking sexual. Oh my God, I'm with him now. Uh, that's it. We're going to get naked and down at it. We can't have a proper conversation anymore. All this is the damage of what the Hadith has done, the damage of the school of thought have done, the damage that these sheikhs, these scholars, these, 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 these people have done. The Quran doesn't say that. But what can we say since when we listen to the Quran? So Allah tells them now there is another extra element that has been put in and that is a, an obstacle that the Prophet had to build in his home. And it's not the woman that needs to cover her face. It's not the woman that should wear the hijab as like they made the women do. And I promise you, my dear sisters and my brothers, I will make, I will write uh, a, a booklet with, I've already started, it's about, uh, I think, 30 pages on it. It's called the Women Dress Code in the Quran. And I have brought pictures and I have, the, it's full of extremely, once you see that, you're going to bang your head against the wall for having, for having worn, yeah, for having worn that stupid garment on your hair for all these years and thinking that I am obeying Allah when you are in fact just copying the Jewish women. Today women are dressing normally and she just covers her head and that's the hijab. Why is just because Arab women have dry, ugly hair? Is that what Afro hair? That's why they hide it? So my sister, the hijab now is just like I don't see your hair. What's wrong with the hair? What's wrong with the hair? But anyhow, so far now we go back to our talk. Allah's instruction is as follow. All you who believe, do not enter the houses of the Prophet unless you are permitted for a meal and do not wait for the food to be prepared. And if you are or when you are invited, then go inside. Once inside and you had your meal, disperse and do not linger for a chat. That you lingering and staying behind certainly was hurting to the Prophet. And he felt shy, he felt deranged, he felt disturbed, he felt everything with you. But Allah is not shy of telling the truth. Then he carries on. And if you ask them for any item relating to your meal, then ask them from behind a hijab, the screen. Now things are getting narrower. So the hospitality restrictions are getting narrower by the minute. And one can only ask why. Why is Allah doing all this? After all, they were just hungry men, right? Looking for one of the basic human needs, food. But the truth of the matter is uh, this. These men weren't at all after the food. These men were after the wives of the Prophet. And they used the food as an excuse to get into his rooms. All the wives of the messenger were under that. And just thinking that they were, uh, subhanAllah, these believers, ah, oh, and then they come to us and lie that the, the companions were people, they loved the messenger, they were so respectful, they obeyed, and they, oh, it's a lie, Allah, it's a lie. But look, Allah addresses those who have believed, ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. But you know, they, they, this is incredible really, but they, anyway, these men were certified believers by Allah himself. Yet they had some nasty sexual perversions. 
and uh, it's really despicable attitude that they showed towards the Prophet himself. And there is a reason behind the reason. They used the food as the reason to eat, but behind the reason, they were after the wives of the messenger. So Allah used the same strategy, there is a reason behind the reason. The reason to wear a garment on top of your dress, that's a reason to go outside, but the reason behind the reason was that Allah wanted the, those perverts to know that these ladies were believers and they were not up to be hit upon. Then Allah tells them why they should ask behind a veil, with a, behind a screen. He tells them, ذَلِكُمْ أَطْهَرُوا لِقُلُوبِكُمْ وَقُلُوبِهِنْ Asking them behind those screens is purer for your hearts and for their hearts. You know, if, when you flirt with somebody, something gets to the heart. You like it or you don't like it, you're a human being. There you have it. Allah, with all these instructions, that he put in place to regulate their behaviors was to safeguard their hearts from any attraction, further attractions, and also to protect the heart of the wife's prophet so that they don't get attracted to other male. Remember the prophet, at this, when this ayah was coming, was 60, uh, 56, 57. At 56, at 57, the sexual prowess of a male is not as when he was 20, 22, 23. And so when you have young men, 30, 35, hitting on women young, a woman tells you, oh my God, at this age, especially the wives of the messenger were young, they will tell you, oh my God, at this age I can still pull. Okay, I'm still sexy, I, I have it in me. So Allah wanted to stop that and he wanted to keep the heart of the believers clean for any, from any sexual perversion to the wives and also the wives to keep their hearts clean from their sexual perversion. So as far, let me read now the instruction of Allah as uh, what he said. He, do not enter the house, O you who believe, addressing the belief, do not enter the house of the Prophet unless you are permitted for a meal. And do not wait for the food as it is prepared. And when you are invited, then go inside. So you gotta wait for permission. Once you uh, have had your meal, then disperse and do not linger for a chat or coffee or tea, whatever you came for food, get out. And because that is really hurting the Prophet and he gets shy and embarrassed to tell you out, but Allah doesn't get embarrassed when he tells the truth. And once you are inside and you start eating, uh, you, when you want to ask the wives for something, don't go through the Prophet, ask them directly, there is no problem with that. But Allah says on one condition, there must be a screen between you two. And the reason you ask her behind the screen, that would keep your hearts and their hearts pure. It's okay. So that's it, it's clear, right? Well, guess what? Comes another step where Allah wants the people not to hurt the Prophet. Not now, not later, not never. Do not, don't think of hurting the Prophet any longer. You gotta keep in mind, my sisters and my brothers, Muhammad was a human being just like any of us. Nothing special about him, believe it, nothing special. It's not like when it's winter, people are cold on him, he walks normal like he's in summer. Why? Because Allah gave him the ability to get hot. Now, he will get cold as well. And if it's extremely hot, he will get hot and he will sweat and he will stink. The act that, oh, his sweat was, uh, was sent, uh, the, his sweat that comes out of the body was scented. No, it was not scented. That's why he used to take shower and he used to wash himself and, and put perfume on him. Because if he didn't, he would stink like any other human being out there. See, he got cold when people got cold and hot when they got hot. He got hungry. Everything that a human, he is not different to you and me. The only thing that sets him apart, he receives the Quran and he was the best at applying the Quran in his time. Okay, and in our time, we have our time, we apply the Quran here, but he applied it back in his time and he did a good job at it. So when he sees a man or two or three eyeing his partner, his wife, they check her out, they look at her head, her back, they look at her butt, they look at everything and they eyeing her. And if he saw a man chatting up his wife and he can see that both have in their way of speech flirtation, he wouldn't like it. But being who he is, he couldn't do anything about it because it's so easy 
not to let that happen because the moment he tells them you they will get back at him you see a regular person me you or anyone else would take the matter into hands and act in a way I go and punch the man and kick him until he drinks blood but say don't talk to my woman like that man call it jealousy call it whatever you see in our time in Europe a woman wants to do what she wants and if the man talks oh my god he's jealous I don't like jealous man or he's too controlling no, I'm not too, too controlling I'm not too jealous you with me you stick with me a lion would kill for his female and I would kill for mine there is no difference between me and him we share a lot in this aspect same thing for a woman oh my god uh, oh, oh she is jealous and well, usually women we don't use that thing i don't like jealous women but anyhow so a regular person would may take the matter into hands punch the, the head of the other one until judgment day comes in the prophet he wouldn't do that and if people start turning away from islam because its prophet is over jealous is overprotective or even reads into things way far than they should then we don't need to be in this religion where the man is weak and things like that so Allah again steps in and shuts the door in front of those psychos for once and for good he tells them وَمَا كَانَ لَكُمْ أَن تُؤْذُوا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ and it is not fit for you you don't owe it that you should ever heard the messenger of Allah look here in the other ayat he talks about the Prophet but when it came to Islam he jumps to the uh, messenger and you should never ever have it in you it's not befit of you to hurt the messenger of Allah subhanallah it's incredible how Allah switched from describing Muhammad as a prophet the husband I think like that to describe him as the messenger because Islam is in jeopardy Islam is in danger because of what they do in these believers they think with the head between their legs and they should think with the head on their shoulders Islam is in danger but the fact that the Prophet wasn't personally hurting his persona but the hurt is deep inside him it's his wife it's Islam Allah Ta'ala wants to shut down the door in front of those psychos once and forever and that's why he reveals to them وَلَا أَن تَنْكِحُوا أَزْوَاجَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ أَبَعْدًا It is not fit for you and it should never owe it that you must hurt the messenger of Allah and that you should never ever marry any of his wives after him ever Ooh, an atomic bomb that's it their ideas of marrying oh I'm gonna marry her and the other one is gonna marry the other one and I start building a relationship with her now so that when Muhammad dies I jump on opportunity and marry that's it now Allah tells them you will never ever hurt Muhammad as he is alive and not when he is dead you cannot marry his wives either and then Allah tells them that i.e. you wanting to marry his wives after his death كان عند الله عظيما would have been a great offense with Allah Ooh, that's the eye of the cyclone all what they did that secret perversion chatting up flirting everything came to an end it crashed down with this end that's it you cannot do that of course when this ayah came down the believers that were there they started oh my god what's this Quran who, 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 who said that we uh, what me and because these believers that used to go to the Prophet and all these things were known they know each other people started looking at them with one raised eyebrow ah, okay you busted you guys were after his wives imagine my sisters and my brothers you have people that befriend you my brother but actually they just use you to get to your wife and they want you to die so that they can marry her reverse the roles you have ladies that come visit you my sister and get to you and all that kind of stuff and befriend you but their eyes are on your husband and they wait for you to die so that they marry him how would you feel how would you feel how would I feel God will eat them life if they do that then these people started Oh God, what's that? 
and they went into a state of denial. They denied it all. They never had any ill intention towards, towards the wives of the Prophet. No, we just went for meal, man. Yeah, oh, it's not me. Maybe it's someone else and Allah revealed the Quran and... No, 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 no. Ah, me marry the wives of the Prophet. <laughs> Come on. When in fact all of them psychos were like that because Allah speaks and He speaks the truth. And of course you can see why they denied it all. Who would, who would show their face when people learned that these men were crooks with sexual, with secret sexual perversions, with little respect to the Prophet himself, to the husband himself. And they have no, absolutely no respect to the bond of marriage that all people honor. When I was single, I would, I would chase girls like every young man. And the first thing we always do is look at the hand, the left hand of the woman to her ring finger. If she's wearing a ring finger, that's that. Don't approach, she's married. But those psycho believers were now going around town, cleaning their tarnished reputation. And of course, by doing that, they lie to people in all kinds of manners. And to put an end to these lies and discrimination and disinformation that Allah is witnessing, Allah witnesses another, uh, Allah reveals another ayah. An ayah that's going to bust them more open. And he tells them, إِن تُبْدُوا شَيْئًا أَوْ تُخْفُوهُ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا He speaks to these people, to these perverts. He tells them, whether you reveal something of the truth or hide it away from people to get in denial, just know Allah is all-knowing of everything. So what Allah is telling this perverse is that you can lie to people. You can say things which you know don't exist and aren't true. But rest assured that you cannot play those tricks on Allah because whether you acknowledge your ill behaviors towards the Prophet or his wives or hide it away or hide away the true motives and what you planned in your hearts, just know Allah knows everything and all is clear. This started making or bringing another disaster on the Prophet. It really, this, this, the whole incident now started cooking something against the Prophet. You know what was the problem? The problem was that now all the believers, every single male in the believing community that lived in Al Madina, started distancing him, themselves away from the Prophet. They wouldn't talk to him, they wouldn't address him, they kept distance from the Prophet. Why did they do that? Because every believer, especially that Allah addressed all the believers in one go, all the believers were absolutely and totally and fully conscious of the possibility of being pointed to by the rest of the city. The moment you speak, let's say, yeah, um, we are living with the Prophet and the perverts are a bunch of people there. I am not a pervert or you are not a pervert. But... When we go and talk to the messenger, everybody else, including those perverts, will point the fingers, aha, uh -huh, these are the people that are that Allah spoke about. Oh my God, Abdus Salam. So you're chasing the wives of the messenger? I go, no. You go, yeah, God, yeah, yeah. We see how you behave with the messenger. In a little time, the entire Medina, the male, stopped talking to the messenger and they kept distances. Not only that, even the families, the male members of the families of the wives of the Prophet stopped interacting with the Prophet. Why? Because wife A, she has a brother, she has a father, she has this, right? Five B, uh, sorry, wife B has her brother, has father, things like that. Well, the, f the male family of uh, wife B wouldn't talk to the messenger because wife A, people would accuse them that they were eyeing and flirting with wife A. So everybody stopped. Stopped, 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 stopped talking to the messenger. Imagine you are a city, you are a messenger of Allah, nobody talks to you. All the believers keeping their distances away from you. How would you feel? How would you feel? If you have a partner that doesn't talk to you two hours, you start feeling not good. Oh my God, what's wrong? Why are they behaving like that? Imagine a whole city. So Allah, 
needs now to do something else to resolve a problem. Then Allah issues a statement and He says, لا جناح عليهن في آبائهن There is absolutely nothing wrong on the wives to face, to meet, to invite their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their nephews or the sisters' sons or the posterity, the male that are going to, born, to be born later nor what their right hands possesses, i.e. the male man that used to work private employees with the wives of the Prophet. Oh, so now Allah is saying, okay, everybody keep away from the Prophet except the parents, the children, the brothers, the kids, the nephews of the brother or nephews of the sister, or the workers, the male workers, you can work. So these now have been granted special permission by Allah. No one can point the finger to them because now the ayah is clear. So if for example Abu Bakr goes to visit his daughter and nobody's gonna accuse him of being a sexually pervert because he tells them I'm here because Allah has said that. The list is simple, right? Guess what? These, <laughs> the, the Salafi cult holds an opinion that is extremely disturbing. Really, really, the Quran has said this. And what did Shaykh they say? Oh, you know what? The woman, she can be herself only when she is with these male people. That she can be, she can be with her dad and that's it. She can remove the khimar from her head and present. I, I had a Shaykh tell me this, your daughter needs not to wear hijab. I told him, yeah, Shaykh, my daughter when she was born, I placed the diapers, I cleaned hair, and all the way until she grew up a little bit. My daughter, I held her in my arms. I saw her grow into the beautiful woman. You telling me now that my daughter can show her hair to me? What kind of issue? Because this is Allah's law. I said, you are a liar. Allah doesn't have a law. Allah has a set of instruction and He gave us indications on how we can run our lives and that's that. There is no such thing as a law. I just want to stop here because I'm getting to the minute 47 and we'll carry on inshallah in the next part uh, about the story of this. I'm sorry it's taking long but this is not just to tell you what it is. This is to help you understand the Quran and all the elements surrounding it so that you can become more educated and ain't nobody in the future that's gonna laugh on you or make you believe in something because following something for 40 years and then you follow and you find out you were you were following nothing dust in the wind is extremely dangerous people have died with that so what I'm doing here I'm talking about this problem from this issue from all angles so that once I finish you have a good idea and it would change your life for the better so now off to the part two of this story Salam alaikum.